I believe I know something about you. A few things. Number one, you like to be generous. Number two, you want to be happy. And number three, you want to make a difference in this world. In other words, you don't want to live a meaningless, purposeless life. Anybody disagree with any of those three statements? Just raise your hand. I knew I wouldn't see any hands on that. Uh, you want to make a difference. You want your life to be meaningful. We've been, since March, looking at a, a passage of Scripture. Really, we started it back in February, but we, we've titled the, the, the sermon series, Impact. Some of you thought, we just forgot to take this down. And it's been up there so long, it's just become part of the decor, you don't even realize it. But actually, we have been in that six, seven month sermon series called Impact, because that's what Jesus is training followers of Him to do, is to impact the world, to let Him impact their life, and consequently, their life will impact the world. We started that with what we're going to look at. We're going to cycle back to that today, and the good news is there will be a new banner up there next Sunday, so you won't have to look at it anymore. You probably didn't even realize it was back there because, uh, so you, you just you want your life to make a difference. You don't want to live a meaningless, purposeless life. You want to be happy. The desire to be happy compels you to do much of what you do. I hope you know that. You are on a happiness quest. You're on a happy, and you want to be generous. Billions of dollars are donated to charitable organizations in the United States every year. And we hear about huge donations made by Bill Gates and Microsoft and other, uh, but the, really the, the majority of the money that's given is given by people like you and me. We don't hear about those, but you know, from the billions of dollars given to charitable causes, both religious and non-religious, millions, just think, you know, there's no way we can list all these, millions of meals that are taken to somebody when they're sick. right? Or what about the Hundreds of thousands of shirts that are given right off the back. Helping the neighbor, uh, helping your friends. So you want to be generous. I also believe that you've already figured something else out. Not every choice you have made has contributed to your finding meaning in life. Anybody disagree with that? You don't have to live very long to find out that although I want to live a meaningful, purpose-driven life, to coin a phrase from Rick Warren, not every choice that we've made has contributed to our finding meaning, and not everything that we thought would make us happy has made us happy. And it's probably not as been as generous as you would have liked to have been. And the reason for that is because, well, maybe you've overcommitted your finances to pay for those things you thought would fulfill your life and make you happy. And now Visa and Master are collecting those debts. Right? Well, that describes, I think, maybe not you guys, but the vast majority of Americans. I believe that to be true. So maximum impact. How to maximize our impact. That's what Jesus has been training us to do. That's what he's been training followers of his to do for centuries. So I think he knows how to do it. He knows how, and he started that back then, and, and Matthew was part of that. Matthew is the guy that listened to Jesus, one of those guys that followed Jesus. He was one of those guys that was a down and out, a tax collector, hated, traitor in his nation, and he got fascinated by Jesus and started following Jesus, and Jesus started changing his life. And Matthew remembered those things, and eventually he wrote them down, and he's passed them down to us. And I think this Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that Jesus preached wherever he went. I think that explains why Matthew could remember so much of it, because he heard it many times. And so he wrote it down for us. So here we are today. We've been, anytime you read like Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, you're just one person removed from Jesus. Because they listened to Jesus, they wrote it down, and, and, and we got to picture ourselves as learning from Jesus. And because discipleship, that, that process of learning, a disciple is a learner, is a lifelong process. It's not a class you take, a course you take. It is a lifelong process of learning and adjusting our lives to the, what Jesus is, is all about. So Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 14 through 16, cycle back to that as we bring to a conclusion our series uh, impact with this message that I've called Maximum Impact. You are the light of the world. I think Jesus might have paused when he said that. You, you, and you. 
you. You who follow me are the, not a, light. The light. And by saying that, he's saying there is no other light. There is no other light. There is not other ways. There is not other religions. There is not other gods. There is no, you are the light of the world. Then he said, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. You don't light a candle at home and then cover it up. You don't light, turn on your flashlight and then cover it up so nobody can see it. Instead, they put it on its stand, they lift it up, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Of course, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have these things hanging in this, you know, built into the ceiling. They turn on a light and it comes down from above. Uh, you know, that they would light a candle and put it on uh, something that was up high that would give light to everybody in the room. In the same way, in the same way, listen, this is what he's saying to us. In the same way, put, put your life up on a lampstand. Don't hide under the bed. Don't cower in the corner. Don't go into a closet and, and hide. What he's saying is, look, following Jesus is a personal experience, but it's not a private experience. It's not something <coughs> that we keep to ourselves. It's something that is meant to be shared. Something like putting that light up on the lampstand. In the same way, let your light shine before men, before others, so that they can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So as I was thinking and praying about this, I really saw three things that kind of jumped out at me that I want to share with you. Three things. If you're taking notes, using the back of your bulletin or whatever. First of all, gospel. Gospel. You know what gospel means? Just like Beulah. Sometimes we use words, we don't know what they mean. Gospel means good news. It's a message. It's a message of good news. For Buckeye fans, there was very good news about 11.40 last night. For Penn State fans, there was not. Right? Good news. That's what the word just simply means. It's, it's, it's a message of good news. And in that day in which it was written, it didn't necessarily have a religious connotation to it. It was just good news. Hey, good news. Hey, I got some good news for you. The team won. You know, the Romans won that battle over there in Greece, whatever. Good news. So that's what it, it just means, good news. And, and, and gospel... Uh, the gospel is good news. And then if you look at this, you think, wait a second, Jeff. I don't see gospel mentioned in this passage of Scripture, but it's, it's there. It's not just implied. It's all over. I just chose that word uh, because it is the light. The gospel is the light. So I, I want to take you through some things this morning because we, you, followers of Christ, are the light of the world. You are the light, of, you are the light that some people will only see. You are that light. You are that light that some people will only see. You may be the only light that some people see. You may be a series and a change of lights that, 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 that people see. But you may be the only light. You and I are the light of the world. Because the true light, Jesus, lives in us. John chapter 1. I'm going to take you through some passages of Scripture I don't really like to do this on Sunday mornings, but I'm going to do it uh, this morning because I think you're smart and I think you can follow along. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, way, way back when, was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, uh, the, He was in the beginning, with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. So whatever the Word is, it's a Him not an it. And he was in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. Nothing. In him was life. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness never overcomes light. Light always overcomes darkness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now that's referring to John the baptizer, that guy that we know, John the Baptist in Scripture. So that's who that guy, uh, a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. 
that light. Now, obviously, this is beginning to drill down and help us to understand that he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is that light, the light uh, that shines in the darkness, the light of all mankind. Uh, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him, all might believe. Through Jesus, all might believe. He himself was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John had the privilege on one occasion of saying to uh, some of his disciples when they saw Jesus walk by, he said, look, there's the one. There's the one. There's the one. And in the terminology that John used, there's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. John was pointing others to the light that came into the world. So the light really is talking about the gospel. Now Paul summarized the gospel for us. What is the gospel? It's, it's, it's good news. Paul summarizes it for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now Paul wrote this and said to the church in Corinth that he had helped start. Now he's writing back to them. And he's saying, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to remind you of the gospel. I don't want you to forget this. I, I preach to you. Now, why would Paul want to remind them of the gospel? Because sometimes we can lose sight of it. Sometimes we just get cut, so caught up in life, everyday life, uh, making a living, paying bills, you know, doing those kinds of things, we can forget about what is most important. So I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. You've received that gospel. You've received it. See, the gospel of Christ is something that's not just meant to be believed, but received. Receive it into your life. Let it change you. He says, so by this gospel, you're saved. It's the gospel of salvation. salvation or saved means rescued, delivered. That by this gospel, you're saved. If you hold form, form, firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you. So Paul's saying, look, I learned the gospel myself, and I passed it on to you. And uh, as of first importance. So what he's saying is, when he says these are the things that are of first importance, what he's saying is, this is the foundation of what we today call Christianity. This is it. This is what's most important. First importance, most important, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, as, as Paul looked back on the death of Christ, and of course he would have been something of an Old Testament scholar as a Pharisee, he, he began to realize Man, this is exactly what Isaiah wrote about. This is exactly what Jeremiah wrote about. This is exactly what Ezekiel wrote about. Probably had in mind Isaiah 53. You can go back and look at that and just to see the parallels there. Some extra credit that you can do. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures foretold this. God didn't just make this up in that first century. This is something that God had been planning for centuries, even before the creation of the world, Scripture tells us. So, uh, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, because that's, that's what happens when you die, you get buried, and that He was raised on the third day. Now look at this, according to the Scriptures. So there's, He gives us two witnesses here to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first one He mentions is the Scriptures. Scriptures foretold that. This, this is not like something brand new. This is what God had been saying all along, according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared. Now, these are the, this is the second witness to the resurrection, second kind of witness. He appeared to people. He mentioned Cephas, Peter, uh, and then to the twelve. Really eleven, but the twelve was because Judas kind of did his betrayal thing and then hung himself. So it was really eleven at that point. <clears throat> But they called themselves the Twelve. They were called the Twelve. So that was, that was understood. And then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. 500. So what, what, what Paul is saying is, look, there are 500 people that you can go to right now at that point in time, and, and say, these are witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This was not something that was done in secret, in private. 500 at one time. And then he appeared to James. James was... His own brother. I can imagine that conversation. James, it took you a while to come around. I know it must have been hard having the Son of God as your brother. I understand. Yep, I really was perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, I know that just magnified your imperfections. And Yep, I really was perfect. Nope, I never really 
You know that time you lied and said I did it? I didn't do it. You know, Just imagine that conversation. So he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me, that's Paul, as one, he says, abnormally born. Because I wasn't a part of that original crew. I wasn't a part of the original 12. Uh, but I become a part of that. So it's kind of like abnormally born. I came in at a later date. That's, that's what he's saying. So that's the gospel. He says that Christ died <clears throat> for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and then He was raised on the third day, raised from the dead. That's the essence of the Gospel. Christ died for our sins. That He was buried and that He arose from the dead. That's the essence of the good news. That's what the light of the world it really is all about, that Christ, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. There's a lot of ways you could say it. But Christ died for our sins. He was buried and then He arose from the dead. Paul later wrote in Romans in chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed because it, the gospel, is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It is the power of God. There's something powerful that happens in a person's life when they believe. There's a power, there's an energy, it's the life of God that comes within us. It's a transformation, it's miraculous. It's the life of God that comes to live within us, and it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And then Paul wrote this later on to a guy by the name of Timothy, a young pastor. He talks about Jesus, this is 1 Timothy 1.10, Jesus who has destroyed death, has destroyed death, and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is something else I know about you. You want to live forever in a good place. You are going to live forever somewhere. When he's talking about life and immortality to light, he's talking about eternal life. He's talking about uh, that ultimate Beulah land, that ultimate heaven, that, that land where God is very present, not distant, not far away. And, and, and so he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel is the light. And when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, part of what he's saying is you have the message of life. You and you alone have the message of life. Nobody else has it. And what he's saying is, I'm counting on you. I don't have a plan B. I don't have plan C. I don't have plan D. You are plan A. You are it. You are it. You are the light of the world. And as the gospel impacts us, and we let it transform us, we begin to impact those around us. So the gospel. Secondly, there's something else I see here, is the mention of good works, good deeds. Good deeds. Look at what he says. Let your light shine before others. That, that's the message of the gospel. That they may see your good deeds. Christians, followers of Christ, good deeds, good works, need to be consistently, intentionally involved in doing good. It's said of Jesus, he went about doing good. He went about, he did a lot of good. Somebody looked at all the different accounts we have of Jesus in the four Gospels, and they figured out this probably only covers about 30 days of his life. 30 days. 30 different days. John wrote at the end of his Gospel, if everything was written about Jesus that could have been written, he says the world, he's kind of being a little bit exaggerated there, but the world could not contain the volume. So what we have in these four Gospels is really the Reader's Digest condensed version. We, we've got what we need. We, we, we've got what, what, we, what, what, what it's helpful to us. We've got all that we need there, but it does not cover everything by any means. So Jesus went about doing good. Think about the kinds of things that he did. He helped the hungry, the widowed, the sick, the outcast. Now, of course, Jesus did those things in ways that you and I can't do, but it doesn't mean we can't make a difference doesn't mean we can't make an impact. And so he went about doing good. He, he, had, he, he did those good deeds. And his good deeds always had a message. Always had a message. And that's where the gospel and the good deeds begin to blend together. Begin to come together. 
He helped the hungry, the widow, the sick, the outcast. But his good deeds always had a message. And this was the message, God loves you and sent his son to be the savior of the world. In fact, in John 6, 26, Jesus had just fed a multitude, one of those times where he fed hundreds of people, thousands of people all, all at once. And then they're looking for him. He kind of disappeared for a while, a day or so. And then they, they, they find out where he is and they go to where he is. And in John 6, 26, Jesus said to them, Very truly, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed. I would come back to that in a moment. But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You got free food. Free lunch. Free breakfast. Free food. People will flock to that. Not just teenagers that will flock to free food. Or children, anyone will flock to free food as long as it's good, right? No, no, Jesus said, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs. So what Jesus is saying, yeah, all those things that I did, the miracles that I performed, all those ways that I helped people, they had a message to them. Because that's what a sign is. A sign has a message. None of us right now are parked around in, in, in camping chairs around the sign that is out on the street out there looking at the sign that says 113117 Cooksey Road. It's a sign that points to something else. right? The sign is not what is, is what most important. The sign is important, but it points to something else. The sign points to something else. And Jesus is saying what the signs are, those miracles, there, there's a message to them. And, and, and this is what it is. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had you. So they saw those things. They saw the miracles, but they missed the message. They saw the miracles, but they missed the message. Don't miss the message. Don't miss the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It alone is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who would believe. Did you know that you're happier when you do good deeds? There's two reasons I know that. Number one, Jesus said it, or at least he's quoted as saying in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know when you don't believe that? You don't believe that when you're a kid. And if you've got two pieces of candy and mom says give a piece to your brother or your sister, then you look at your two and you're going to have one. And you think, it is not more blessed to give than to receive because then I have less. So we think that when we're immature. But when we're mature, when we grow up, it's kind of funny how Christmas was all about what I would get as a kid. Now it's, it took me a while, but now it's about what I can give. I don't, I don't care what I get. Don't, don't get me anything. Yes, my children are in the room. Don't get me anything. You know, it, it's, it's not, it's not, Chris had just went, I'm taking him up on that. I saw that. I saw that look in your eye. Yeah, I recognize that. It's not about what I get. It's about what I get to give. It's about what I get to give. And it is more blessed. Now, notice that Jesus did not say, there's no blessing in receiving. He's, he's not an idiot. <laughs> he's not stupid. There is a blessing in receiving, right? There is a blessing in receiving. But he says it's more blessed to give. And I think that more, you know, there's obviously, if, if, you, if, if you won, uh, received a large financial gift, there would be that joy. If you gave a large financial gift, in that moment it might feel like, Oh, oh! So I think what he's talking about more is in the long run, and it doesn't—I don't mean years, but it may not be that instant. Like, oh, I just won the jackpot! How you know? It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's one of the ways I know it. Secondly, um, Time Magazine reports this. Right. So th this is this is an excerpt from an article uh, called. Uh, being generous really does make you happy. You know, scientists have studied this. And this is from that article in Time magazine called Being Generous Really Does Make You Happier. It doesn't take, quote, it doesn't take a neuroscience to know that doing nice things for people feels good. But now researchers say they've discovered that even thinking about doing something generous has real mood-boosting benefits in the brain. Now, what I'm not recommending is just sitting around thinking about doing good, right? But even thinking about it, even thinking about it, boosts your mood. Doing it 
even more so. So uh, I read through that article. I just summarized it for you. But I also, uh, on a pro- popular search engine, I thought this might be a little bit impressive. You can go ahead and, and pull those up. These are all copied straight from a search engine. You just look at these. Generosity makes you happier. Medical news today. Studies show generous behavior leads to increased happiness. Uh, generosity pays dividends and happiness, reported in Psychology Today. Giving proof as reported in the New York Times. Being generous makes you feel happier, a study reveals. And then the last one that I just copied and pasted, being generous is the key to happiness, says a study. And so you can look those up. You can read that research for yourself. Being generous does make you feel better. So generosity, good deeds with a message. Think about it. We, we, we have the opportunity, as followers of Christ, to make the biggest impact. There's all kinds of... Red Cross does hurricane relief, right? And that's fine. I'm grateful for that. I'm glad. But hurricane relief in the name of Jesus does two things. It takes the light of the gospel, and it takes the needed necessary supplies at the same time. So Jesus is saying, let your good deeds have a gospel message to it. Let the good deeds have a gospel message to it. Let pe- Jesus said, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you will not lose your reward. Even as something as simple as. So when it comes to good deeds, maximum impact on your life that also benefits others is best achieved when it's more than a random act. In fact, the danger of random acts is that they can actually mask our lack of generosity. An occasional love offering makes us feel good that we put some money in a plate or we collected some some things to help somebody in a time of need, and we feel generous. But let me ask you, is that a lifestyle of generosity? It can actually mask our lack of generosity. So, and here, here's, here's, here's something to think. This is, you, this, is, this is challenging, so get ready. Instead of working, I think of volunteers in service, and you think of it in church or another. Instead of working and volunteering, uh, volunteerism around their schedule, well, if I've got time, I will. Scheduling your other activities around the volunteerism. People that are going to make maximum impact in this world are going to do the second way. Maximum impact, because we believe the message. It's not just if I have time. It's not just if I have time. It's the intentional, consistent, sacrificial pattern of life. Good deeds with the gospel message. And then the last thing I see here uh, is... Uh, gathering. Jesus talked about a city set on a hill. Last uh, early December, I was in out west uh, with a a kind of a senior kind of a trip with my son Jonathan. We went out. Las Vegas was our hub of cheap transportation and cheap hotels. But from there, we went to uh, Grand Canyon. We went to Zion National Park. We went to uh, Hoover Dam. We did some Red Rock Canyon, which is close to Las Vegas. So we, just, so that was, so we were just out places. So two, two, two contrasting experiences. One was coming back from the Grand Canyon. Now this was early December, so the time change had already happened, so it's dark, 6 o'clock at night. So when we're driving the four hours back from Grand Canyon back to Las Vegas, you know, we're driving Interstate Highway, coming through the Mojave Desert. We'd see a light here. We'd see a light there. We'd see a light here. We'd see a light there. You know, there wasn't a conglomeration of lights. Contrast that to coming back from Zion National Park, also late at night because of the three, three and a half hour drive that it was. We come, and it wasn't a city set on a hill. We actually came over a rise and kind of came down into something of a valley, same Mojave Desert. This time, the millions of lights of Las Vegas just spread out in front of us. Not one light, not a light here, not a light there, but a gathering of lights. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. A city set on a hill. A city set on a hill is more than a light here and a light there. A city is a gathering of like-minded people 
there for a common cause, all gathered together in that location. Oh, they go out, they do their thing, they go to work, they, they do their thing, but they're gathered in a, in a common location. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Part of what Jesus is saying here is we can do more together than we can do individually. When we combine our forces, we can accomplish more. And he said later on, and I think this is a, a forerunner to that, in Matthew chapter 16, when he asked his disciples, who, who, what's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? Who, who do they say I am? Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus commends him. Um, he says, blessed are you, this is Matthew 16, blessed are you, Simon, in other words, good job, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now listen to this. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now some people believe that Jesus was building his church upon Peter. Peter was not a rock. Peter waffled lots of different times. What the, the, what the, the rock that was being built on was what Peter stated. You are the Christ the Son of the living God. The church is built upon Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. Now look at that. I will build my church and the gates of Hades, health, uh, not, not health, but, but death, the gates of death will not overcome it. Now I just want to explain something to you. Some of you got up this morning and said, I'm going to church. And you were thinking of 13117 Cooksey Road. because That's the address of this place. You're thinking, when you think about church, you think of the building that we gather in. Did you know that that is not church? Now, it has come to be that way in the American mindset. The, the, the location, the address, the physical structure. But when Jesus said, I will build my church, he was not talking about physical structures. He was not talking about a building that has an address to it. Because the word church, really, you've, you've ever heard of ecclesia or ecclesiastical? Have you ever heard that English word? That, that's, that's a rendition of the Greek word from which this comes from. It's, in fact, it's called a transliteration. You take the Greek word ecclesia and you turn it in. But anyway, uh, what it is, <clears throat> is this. There's actually a combination of two words. One is ek, which means out of, out of, ek out of. The second one is kaleo, something pronounced something like that, which means to call. So the word church means to call out of, to call out of. In Acts, here's an example where it's used not in terms of a religious gathering, but in terms of an assembly of Roman citizens. In Acts chapter 19, verse 39, that same word, ecclesia, was used in reference to a lawful assembly of Roman citizens that had gathered together. Just, it means assembly. It means gathering. This is church. You can have church under a palm tree. You can have church in a Nipa hut. You can have church down by the riverside. You can have church sitting around a swimming pool. You can have church because it's gathering. People that have been called together, called out of together for a common purpose. Church, so this is it. Did you, uh, I'm going to give you an underst my understanding of church, but did you know, listen to what Jesus said, I will build my church. That's a prophecy. It had not yet happened. It's a, you know that your gathering together here today is part of prophecy? You are helping to fulfill prophecy. You are joining together in what God has been doing since the beginning of the ages. I was thinking about that. When, 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 a, when an athlete goes to a, a, a college, a university, they get caught up in the history of that university, the history of that athletic program. You go through, you see the former players that are now you know, pro football Hall of Famers. You, you begin to feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. It's just not about me and me making my mark. I'm part of something bigger. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. You're part of something bigger. You're part of the thing that makes 
the biggest difference in the lives of people because it alone can make the eternal difference. But we're also supposed to make the temporary difference with the good deeds. right? So we combine those things together. So here, here, here is what church is. A collection of like-minded individuals focused on, number one, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said this is of first importance, never losing sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, doing good wherever we are, whenever we can. Wherever we are, whenever we can. Thirdly, gathering together. A city, a city, not a lone ranger. A city, a village, a town set on the hill for maximum impact. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. And when, when, we, when he said, for God so loved the world, and Jesus said that, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have, what? Everlasting life. Life in light of eternity. Eternity past, and eternity present, eternity future. God is inviting us into what he's always been doing. Your will, God's will for your life, is directly related to God's will for mankind. Maximum impact comes when we plug into that, when we plug in to that by receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ, receiving Christ into our life. Simple act of faith, receiving Christ. Following Him. Following Him. Gathering together. Gathering together. This is like the coaches meeting, right? Gathering together. But we, we can accomplish more together than we can individually. But now we scatter. We go to those individual places where we work, where we live, where we go to school, where, whatever we do. We're taking that light wherever we go, but we gather back together. Gathering is always a vital part of the Christian experience. So let's pray. Father, thanks for the invitation to life through Jesus Christ. And how I pray, God, that you um, will make Spring Hills, Utica, more and more a city set on a hill. That the combination of the gospel and the good deeds, the gospel and the kindness, the gospel and the love, the gospel, which is all about love, the love of God for us, the gospel, first importance. Help us to never lose sight of that. So I pray, God, for men and women to receive that gospel message into their heart by receiving Christ. I pray for men and women to uh, commit themselves to that of first importance, first importance, not secondary, not let it fall into second or third place in their life, but of first importance. The gathering together as you build your church. In your name I pray. Amen.